USA truck at 435 million including assumed cash and debt. The wow. board has already approved this and it looks like it's expected to clear by the end of 2022. So I, uh, I, I got to call up Tim. I got to find out what's going on. Yeah, we got to get a hold of Tim and get our swag, right? Yeah, well, Rooster's <laughs> on top of that. I know that oh, okay, Rooster's good. Uh, taking good, a look Good, 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 good. Yeah, Let's talk about some on. autonomous truck safety. That's I a love big, that. That is a big issue. And I know sure. that in the green room, we got Michelle Chaka. She's the director for safety assurance and standards at Locomation. Michelle, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, we got her muted. Can we unmute Michelle, please? I'll try again. There Here we, we are. are. Yes, now we got you. All right, cool. <laughs> it's great when technology works. Yeah. So how are things going? We, uh, you know, I was just on your LinkedIn, and I saw that you were at the Michigan International Speedway. We got a picture from that. Guys, show that, please. Tell us a little bit about what was happening there. Yeah, thanks. Um, well, it was, it was incredibly cool, but I'm not as sure as it's as cool as being here with you today. But, uh, you know, I have to owe a big thanks to my dad. He's a huge car guy, and this was on his, his bucket list. And uh, just a little bit about me, I grew up in Southeast Michigan, so I, I bleed the auto industry. It was kind of the way of life. Uh, so, you know, it's an experience that my family and I will never forget. And, you know, you said that, you know, I'm the director of, of safety insurance at Locomation. And so as a mom that has worked in safety my entire career, you know, seeing my kids drive 140 around a track um you know for some reason when i did it, it was no problem but i'm telling you my heart was in my stomach when they were going around it but what it, you know it really did help me reflect on you know, just how cool that the industry is and how lucky i am to to work at localmation and work on the the technology of the future so you know that's a great so thanks that's for a well, that's a great point you make too, because like <laughs> autonomous companies, and I know that there, 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 there's some fear, right? And that's part of the, the industry's job is to quell those fears because we all have family members on the road. Uh, these companies aren't all just empty black boxes. So there's real people here who have different approaches to safety. What is Locomation's yeah. approach to human guided autonomy? Yeah, and you know what, honestly, um, you know, my job as the insurance director of safety, um, safety assurance and, and standards is I really lead our development and implementation of safety metrics, policy standards and procedures. So I'm really kind of overseeing ex exactly how we're, we're going through that. And so one of the th reasons I, I really drew me um, to Locomation is really their approach to being able to combine the best of both worlds. So combine the, the humans, what humans do really well, and what autonomy does really well. And so the bottom line is, you know, don't tell my boss this, but my job is, is a little bit easier. Um, because, you know, we're starting from that really knowledgeable experience and a really great approach on how to go forward with um, autonomy. Yeah, so Michelle, we want to get into the VSSA and locomotions in particular. But before we do that, what is a VSSA, a voluntary safety self-assessment? Yeah, so um, VSSA, so voluntary safety self-assessment. And this is uh, really based on U.S. Uh, Department, uh, the U.S. Department of Transportation guidance for really asking automakers to voluntarily summarize, you know, how are you as a maker of automated driving systems addressing safety? And so they've outlined 12 different priorities and from a safety perspective that automakers should be thinking about everything from cyber to security to information you're providing to the drivers, crash worthiness, education, training, um, really even post-crash response. So what did your VSSA happen to say? Yeah, well, um, anyways, well, let's start with why it matters and, and why we're doing this right now. And so it really serves as a marker to our progress. Um, so why we're doing it now is we're demonstrating our readiness to start testing on public roads. And so Locomation began testing on in Pennsylvania and Ohio. And this VSSA really helps us tell the public, tell people like you, you know, what we're doing to make sure that our technology is safe and how we're ensuring that the way we're going about our, our testing is safe and in compliance with all the regulatory requirements. No, that's beautiful. So um, what, what exactly does your VSA uh, say inside of it? I started going through it and it's quite lengthy, but uh, can you summarize what was in it? Well, it's lengthy, but it's got lots of good pictures. 
It had great pictures. I looked at all the pictures, I swear. I, I read every picture and I, I heard you're a model. I heard you're a model in that big calendar. <laughs> yeah. I read I read I looked at every picture. I read the topics uh, of each one of them, but I didn't get into all of the, the details in it. It was quite lengthy and a lot of stuff involved there. What is it? What's going on there? Yeah, well, we really did want to lay out um, in a way that everyone could understand, but really the, the details of, of what we're doing. And so, you know, at the, you know, at the start of it, what we try to describe is our approach to safety. And so our VSSA describes what we call our safety case. And this is a structured argument that's based on evidence to justify why we're safe. And so this isn't just something that's being used by um uh, autonomous trucking companies, it's used in many safety critical industries such as nuclear, aerospace, also use this same kind of approach. And so we've centered our safety case around one single objective. And so this really is how our autonomous relays should be acceptably safe to operate on roads. And so what I mean by this is making sure that it is free of unreasonable risk and harm to humans and property. And so we start with that top level um, objective and we break it down to what are we doing to engineer it right? What are we doing to manufacture it right? What are we doing to operate it? And how are we improving the technology in a safe manner? And so if you want, I could just take you through a couple of, of aspects and give you some examples. Sure, why not? Sounds great. Yeah, let's hear it. So if you're going to have an uh, autonomous technology, one of the most important things you need to do is understand where you're deploying this technology. How it, what is that environment and what kind of conditions you are going to operate in? And so I talked about a bit why a local mission approach is, you know, has the best of both worlds of combining what a human does well and what a autonomous system does well. And so, you know, as a, a human, you know, we can recognize and understand in context what we come across in, along the road. And autonomy, you know, really has precision of control and the ability to react to that. And so when you take those two um, systems and you put those together, you know, I'm sure all your truck drivers can understand that it has some crazy story about some object or event that happened on the roadway. And so, you know, when you think about delivering a fully autonomous vehicle, I'll tell you the first 10, you know, 90% is pretty easy. It's that last 10% that's really, really hard. And so one of the most important things that you need to do is understand that driving space. And so we go into a lot of detail in our VSSA, how we're using a whole bunch of different data sources and testing and in order to make sure that we understand all of the conditions and operating environments that we will be deploying in. And another big point is no matter how safe you can make this vehicle, you will always have some sort of fault and failures. And so we're being really careful when we're engineering our system to make sure that we have redundancy in all of our safety critical systems and that there isn't one single point of failure. And so we go through in great detail about how we handle faults and how our human driver can safely, you know, put that vehicle in a safe state. And if it's an immediate hazard, how our autonomous truck will put that vehicle in a safe state. Yeah, I saw that part of it, the controls there, where the driver can kind of take control over what's going on there if it gets into a situation, right? Yeah, all really important things. Michelle, if someone wants to check this out or, or get more information about uh, the VSSA, where can I send them to? Yeah, you can um, head over to our website, so localvation. Um, Dot com. Cool. There you go. Yeah. I love no, it. So isn't it is it locomation.ai? Don't we read this all the time? Locomation.ai is what I say all the time. Yeah, it's oh, locomation.ai. Yeah. I'm Michelle. I'm like, I have read that like 600 times now. So I, I think that is, yeah. Go there, Wait, you know. hey, go there directly hi. after the show, Michelle. Say hi to Glenn for us. <laughs> and, and, well, say I hi. need to. I have my um, hard copy. There right you here. go. <laughs> well, excellent. <laughs> well, say hi to Glenn for us and have a great weekend. All right, great. Thank you so much. <laughs> Take it easy.
All right, let's talk <laughs> awesome. to uh, let's talk to uh, John Kingston, editor at large and market oh, expert yeah. at Freeways, because I'm this week has confused me, Michael Vincent. I'm not sure what my opinion is on really? fuel tax holidays or anything. I don't know. I don't. I'm not informed. I don't make opinions on things if I'm not informed enough. So I'm going to get informed now, and then I will have a very obstinate, thick-headed opinion after I talk to John. See, Kingston. I do the exact opposite. I get the obstinate, oh, thick-headed opinion, talk out of it. and then I talk about the data afterwards. All right. Well, maybe John Kingston has an opinion. John, what is going on, man? What's up in the world right now? Oh, there's lots of things going on in the world, you know? <laughs> I, I'm probably the only person in America who's been checking Supreme Court decisions all day long and has nothing to do with Roe versus Wade because yeah. I'm waiting for the because I'm waiting for the court to uh, to announce whether it's going to uh, issue certiorari or a review of the uh, AB5 case in California. It it's it's 12:15, they haven't said anything, so I'm guessing it's going to come on Monday. Mm. So can, can we talk about that one first there a little bit since you brought it up? Because yeah. my confusion is this. If they refuse to hear it, it's good or bad. Or if they decide not to and push it, it's good or bad. How, how, how is this working here, right? If, if, they refuse, if they refuse to grant certiorari, okay, AB5 is implemented in California trucking immediately. Okay. Not a month from now, not six months from now, immediately. Um, if they grant review, well, then we'll see you next term. And they will presumably be... Uh, arguments in front of the court um, about uh, about the case, uh, which of course goes back to you know AB five went into effect in the state on January first, twenty twenty. The day before that, on New Year's Eve, uh, a lower court uh, said that AB five and that, that truck AB five could not be applied to trucking in California because of something called the Federal Aviation Authoriz Federal Aviation Administration Authorization Act F four A. Um, a appellate court said yes, it can. And the uh, question before the Supreme Court is that question of, F, uh, of state state uh, exemption or state preemption of F4A. There was another case involving C.H. Robinson, also an F4A preemption case before the court. I I'm assuming that if they decide to grant certiorari, they would probably uh, grant certiorari to both of them, uh, though the impact of the, 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 the C.H. Robinson case is nothing compared to the impact if AB5 is, uh, is, is allowed to be implemented in, in tr California trucking. But John, so let me ask you. Let me ask you this. So the Supreme Court, they they haven't shied away from making very controversial decisions, as we've all noticed. Where do you think this Supreme Court will fall on this issue? What do you think the outcome will be? Well, you know, I mean, I was I, was, I called the justices the other day to kind of survey them. I'm just kidding, but uh, anyway. <laughs> um, but, Send but, but let, let me say this. First of all, you know, the attorney for the trucking industry were very. Uh, heartened by the fact that the court at least said they will consider certiorari in not just one case, but in two, uh, the uh, the C.H. Robinson case and the far more impactful uh, California Trucking Association case. So the fact that they wanted to look at that and the fact that they asked the Solicitor General for input uh, gave them a lot of encouragement. Now, I will tell you that, the, as we wrote, the Solicitor General said they should not grant certiorari. That, 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 that brief was filed by the Solicitor General about a month ago. Um, about a week later, any uh, sharp-eyed readers of Freight Waves would have seen a large picture of Chico Marx uh, because Chico Marx was cited by the California Trucking Association's brief in response. And I will tell you that I felt the, the CTA brief was really better done than the, uh, than the Solicitor General brief, which had a lot of, well, the trucking industry could do this in response, the trucking industry could do that where I felt the CTA brief really was a lot more definitive about the impact of, uh, of implementing AB5 in California trucking. Uh, you know, you've got two different things. You've got a Biden administration that it tends to be hostile toward the independent contractor uh, model. Uh, you know, you've got a conservative court, which you would think might be a little more uh, welcoming to the independent contractor model, though I don't think there's any real roadmap there, any history. So we will presumably find out on Monday. Now, remember, even if they grant certiorari, they can review it and then say the appellate court was right and AB5 goes into effect, can, AB5 can go into effect in California. But that's still on down the road if that happened, whereas if they deny certiorari right now, then AB5 becomes the law of the, the industry immediately.
Wow. All right. A lot of these, yeah, a lot of these rulings just going into effect immediately too. With the judgment of the the years and all these these other things, it's just like right now this has to happen. John, what about the fuel tax holiday? So there's been so much debate about this, and you had people saying, you know, they put out there, oh, we're going to put out uh, gift cards to people. We don't have enough microchips, and everyone said that's a stupid idea. And people said, well, why why don't you remove the gas tax? They did, and now everyone says that's a stupid idea too. So what is going on with the the fuel tax? Is a good idea, bad idea, good for trucking? Fill us in. Well, I mean, look, you know, I, I think I've, I know I've said this on what well, maybe it was what the truck or certainly on freeways now is that markets. I don't care what the market is, whether it's oil, soybeans, labor, housing, doesn't matter. Markets will balance. They will move toward balance. They will do so in a variety of ways. The bottom line is less demand, more supply. So the given that more supply doesn't appear to be coming in the oil markets, the only way to get to a balance was demand destruction. If you lower the price... Um, by doing this, you really kind of slow the demand destruction. I mean, so maybe it's less painful in the beginning, but you're going to get to that demand, that, that, that clearing price, and you're going to get to it by more supply or demand destruction. In this case, in the market, probably more demand destruction. All you've really done is put that day off by doing this. What will happen is the price will eventually get back to the clearing price. Uh, the government will collect nothing in the process. It will, I mean, this is, again, if, if it's a perfect model, uh, the money will instead flow to refiners and oil companies and whatever. So you really haven't accomplished anything. Now, let me say this, that it's a three-month waiver. Um, is the market going to get to that clearing price in three months? I don't really know. The other thing is, the you know, markets are so volatile that it's going to be very difficult to kind of look at it and say, ah, you know what, that, that decline there, we can point it. We can point to the fuel tax. You know, the, the, the price of ultra low sulfur diesel on the CME is down like 20, like 23 cents, 23, 24 cents since a week ago. Mm. So, you know, pointing, being able to look at everything and, and being able to, to single out where the fuel tax impact was, is going to be rather difficult. Mm. The reality is that right now, the wholesale price of, of diesel and gasoline uh, does not contain the, 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 the tax. However, the tax is paid by the wholesaler and then collected from the retailer. The retailer, it will no longer be collected from the retailer again for these three months. Up to the retailer, do they want to immediately pass that on or do they want to try to hang on to some of it? You know, they, they, I seriously doubt they're going to do 100% uh, all in one shot. They'll probably try to, you know, keep a little bit for themselves. Well, I mean, I would think good so. that thing I with would... the shooting down the gouging thing too, it creates a great opportunity <laughs> to, to do that to with, do the, uh, yeah. with the relief, right? I mean, what's going to stop you? Uh, your, your morals? Yeah, exactly. I don't is know. This, yeah. Yeah. This yeah. There's, an, there's an interesting aspect here, which I, and I really don't, I, this is just kind of me throwing out a theory. Remember, a, a station that, that has the Exxon brand out front is not owned by Exxon. Mm, right. It's owned by an individual. It's owned by maybe a company with no number of stations, whatever. Yeah. Um, Exxon doesn't have the right to set to set the price, but Exxon does have a right to kind of put some pressure on. And if they, a lot of their dealers aren't passing this on, I can imagine the Exxon management thinking this is going to be a real freaking headache for us uh, because it's our brand. And, and, you know, you can explain all that you want about that. We don't own this. The average person is not going to understand that. Yeah. So I wonder if there's going to be any pressure put on by the branded retailers onto the individual retailers themselves uh, to to pass this through. I, I think that's a factor that's kind of hard to measure. Yeah, it really is. But and, and what other is hard to measure is fuel surcharges. What's going on with the EIA? Yeah. What's that? I can't figure out my fuel well, surcharges. Uh, this week. Cutting into your articles, John. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So 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 the price usually comes out on Monday. You know the the weekly retail average retail. The average weekly retail diesel price comes out on Monday. That number is set for fuel surcharges everywhere except California because that's such a screwy market. They tend to use their own price, um, the EIA price on California. It wasn't going to come out on Monday this week. It was going to come out on Tuesday because of the Juneteenth holiday. So I actually was not going to be around when it came out at 5 o'clock. So I went out. I had some personal things to take care of. I came back at like, you know, 730, whatever. Price still isn't out. Right? Are they going to say they're going to put it out? Who's out? John, like, I can't do it. John went out to dinner. <laughs> <laughs> That's why the EIA yeah, yeah. delayed it, right? John so, went so, so then they then they, they then they put out an announcement that said we've got technical problems. Hmm. And then the, the, the statement on the technical problems then developed into we've got real problems and we're not going to release anything this week except the natural gas report that for whatever reason was maybe on a different server or something. But I spoke to the spokesman for EIA yesterday and they, they, they've got hardware problems. 
and they're not totally sure they can do it next week. So the fact is they said that they did collect the data on Monday. So when it comes out, it can be a, an accurate assessment of where the market was on Monday. They were a little vague on whether if these technical problems continue, they can make they can collect the data next week. I think that's really what you got to look at. But, you know, it creates billing problems because, you know, you're, 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 if you're a carrier, you're always sending bills out uh, with, with, your, with a fuel surcharge in and you can't put it in there. So, um, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a problem for the accounting departments. Eventually, you think they would get their money. But this is an in industry where, you know, cash flow is always an issue. Uh, cash flow is, is, is always tight. This is why factoring exists. Factoring isn't going to be affected by this, but this is why factoring does exist. People want to get paid. They want to get yeah. paid quickly. And this is going to slow the level of pay, the, the pace of payment. Wow. Hey, John, thank you for this insight. You actually, you really helped me out in this past 10 minutes because those were three things I really needed to know more. Yeah, about. And, I agree. Uh, and now I do. Uh, well, you know, I, I know I'm on uh, freeways now on Monday. Uh, that presumably before, it would not surprise me the Supreme Court announcement comes right in the middle of freeways now on Monday. Uh, and uh, I'm sure we'll be talking about it again. Okay, we'll yeah. catch John on Freightways now. Catch his audio podcast, Drilling Deep, wherever you listen to podcasts or on the Freightcast feed and find his articles on Freightways.com. John, Amen. thank you so much for joining us. Have a great weekend. You too, guys. Take care. Thanks, John. Thank you. Interesting stuff. You know, Slink IO's payment processor must be on the same server as uh, EIA. <laughs> That's possible. <laughs> With fully furnished, state-of-the-art repair trucks and a full array of roadside tools, you can expect the safest, fastest, and most painless response for your fleet from Love's Truck Care and Speed Co. To learn more about their roadside assistance, tell them, dude. Hey, go to loves.com. That's where you should gotta go. All right, let's take a look at a clip before we go to our next guest oh. of what NASA is up to. All right. on the moon is we're going back in a way that is totally different. We've had almost 60 years of experience and we're taking every single ounce of experience we have and taking that with our international partners, with our commercial partners. We've been working for the last year with three partners who will help us achieve the next human mission to the moon because we know that this first step to the moon will then lead us to go to Mars. And we know that the human landing system is one of the first steps to... NASA has chosen SpaceX to return us to the moon. I am so excited to partner with SpaceX in this fantastic endeavor for the Artemis suite of missions. So congratulations to the SpaceX team. Wow, super cool, super yeah. cool. So we have cool. Tara Polsgrove with us. She's a lead systems engineer for NASA's Human Landing System Program. That's a heck of a title you got there, Tara. It's good to be with you guys today. It's good to be with you. Now, we just saw that video. It looks super cool, right? Going back to the moon. Oh, yeah. yeah. Awesome Gosh, stuff. Yeah. Uh, human landing. So what we're looking at there, too, when we talk about the human landing system, that's the capsule that would actually bring astronauts down to the moon, right? That's right. They'll take uh, our crew and equipment from the lunar orbit down to the surface of the moon. Uh, the astronauts will live out of that vehicle for a certain uh, period of time. And then, of course, they'll take them back off of the surface of the moon where they'll return to lunar orbit and then come home in the Orion capsule. That's unbelievable. So when is this launch expected to happen? Yeah, we're looking at uh, the first, maybe uh, we're going to do an uncrewed test flight uh, in 2024 and then a manned landing in 2025. And I say manned, but crewed, I guess, is the proper word because we'll have uh, women and men uh, on this uh, next landing on the moon. Now, that video, it got me really curious. It mentioned that NASA had looked at multiple partners to, to work with on this particular system. SpaceX was chosen. How does NASA go through that process? How do you, what criteria do you use to select a partner like SpaceX? 
Sure. We've got a, a load of requirements, right? We've got, we have to lay out exactly what we want this system to be capable of doing, how many people we want to take, how much uh, equipment we want to take. Um, uh, we would like to stay on the surface for, uh, you know, a week uh, rather than in the Apollo where it was only a, a few days. Um, and then eventually we want to grow that uh, surface duration up to a month. So we really, really lay out a, a, a series of requirements of what we want this capability to be. And then we offer an, an RFP or request for proposal out to the entire uh, U.S. industry. And we have bidders or proposers that come uh, and offer their unique uh, solutions to that. So unlike in the past where maybe NASA has been involved in the design work and then going off and simply contracting someone to go build, what NASA has designed. This time, we really want a commercial solution where we're asking uh, industry to innovate and show us, um, you know, what unique solutions they can bring to the table to, to get us where we want to be. Um, so we awarded uh, three contractors uh, a, a contract to work with us for a period of time to really mature and develop their, their concepts. And then we ended up down selecting for this first mission to SpaceX. So we're excited to work with them. Uh, we're also working with um, additional contractors. We've got five uh, on board looking at future missions to the moon. So beyond that first landing, uh, there may be other providers or other industry partners that work with us on future landings. Wow. So, Tara, uh, you, you mentioned that you want to be on the surface for, you know, a, a week, yeah. right? So they're going to be in this thing for, I guess, roughly 10 days or something like this. What's it like inside there or what's it going to be like inside there? I mean, you've got a, an importance of mental and physical health while they're there for a solid week. That's right. So they'll be they'll be very busy and, and probably tired. Uh, so for uh, their daily routine, uh, of course, they'll get up and, and get ready. But most of their time will be spent out of the vehicle doing extravehicular activities, mm. going off and exploring the surface of the moon. And it takes a while to get uh, the suits on and get everything ready to go. Um, the physical work of, of lugging yourself around, plus a heavy suit, even in the uh, reduced gravity environment of the moon, it's very physically taxing, uh, but they're going to go off and do some great exploration and, and uh, better understand the resources and geology of the moon. Uh, we think that there's a lot of water on the south pole of the moon, water ice, uh, buried just a little bit below the surface. So they're going to be trying to understand and find and, and see um, how we can go and, and get at those resources and future missions. They'll come back into the cabin uh, exhausted and dirty, <laughs> and we'll have to be uh, cleaning off their suits and, and, and resting and getting ready for the next day. So they've got a, a lot of work ahead of them. And really the, the HLS crew cabin is kind of where they rest, recover and, and plan for their next day. You know, I've been to several space museums, including the one over in Huntsville. That's about two hours from us. You've been there with your daughters yet? It's a good one, Michael. I have Huntsville. not yet, no. Well, but anyways, they have yet. all sorts of space capsules there. Yeah. And I'm a six foot, 200 plus, six foot two, 200 plus pound guy. Yeah. And when we try or you try to sit in one of these capsules, there's not much space at all, right? No. They're super, super crammed. Uh, different era, bigger, bigger people out here in the world now. What is the interior <laughs> like uh, inside the capsule now? Is it more spacious, a little bit more roomy? Yeah. Well, I think you'd be very happy with the SpaceX design. So SpaceX decided as part of their company approach, they want to do more than what NASA um, has required, our minimum requirements. They've gone over and above. So they've got a huge uh, two-story kind of voluminous space uh, that, that crew will be able to um uh, interact in that their cabin will be very large. Um, some of our other providers are uh, still larger than the Apollo uh, capsules, but are, are really more focused on uh, getting the work done that needs to be done uh, with just uh, two to four crew members. But um, I, I think, you know, it varies by our, our industry partners, uh, but uh, uh, we've got a, a kind of range of ideas there. But that first mission with SpaceX, um, uh, it, it will not be the same kind of cramped experience that our Apollo astronauts had. Yeah. You know, there was um between the, the the three different finalists in this thing, they all had yeah. different concepts, right? And you just mentioned kind of SpaceX. Theirs looks the most like a rocket ship. Like if you told a kid to draw a rocket ship, they would probably draw that SpaceX yeah. one. Yeah. And it led me to a couple questions. One, why the difference in design? Did that factor into your decision? And on the SpaceX one, do you just have to like jump out of that? <laughs> or how do you get to the ground? <laughs> That's what I was curious about looking at it. <laughs> 
Yeah, well, SpaceX, the, the look of a rocket is, is designed, uh, it's based on how what it's designed for. And SpaceX has, for their Starship, uh, they want to not only do lunar missions, they want to do Mars missions, they also want to do cargo delivery around the Earth. So mm-hmm. um, they're, uh, the reason they have a, a design like that is because they plan to fly through the atmosphere. So you need that streamlined um, uh, aerodynamic shape. Um, and uh, they're... Uh, egress or how they get out of the capsule that's on top and get to the lunar surface is uh, pretty unique. They're going to use an elevator that comes out of the side of the um, of the rocket at the top. So it's going to be an incredible view for our astronauts when they land on the lunar surface and they uh, open the door and, and they're looking out kind of 100 feet off the ground or so uh, onto the lunar landscape and then uh, slowly descend to the surface. They ride one of those little stair chairs down. You know, I was gonna say, cool. we're spent, we mentioned SpaceX so much, and remember the first time we had NASA on was the yeah. first launch in like a decade from American soil, right? Yeah. And in light of the the current global political atmosphere, it's 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 a blessing that SpaceX and NASA have partnered up to bring space launches back to U.S. So- soil because we'd be in a big problem otherwise. Yeah, well, we've spent a lot of the last decade really doing a lot of investments in the U.S. industry and building some new capabilities. So, yeah, both SpaceX and Boeing have new uh, capabilities to take crew back and forth to the space station. Um, And so that's an exciting time. We also have, as I mentioned, we're working with five companies on uh, uh, space transportation. We've got Blue Origin, we've got Dynetics and Northrop Grumman and Lockheed and um, so we've got a lot of development uh, across our uh, U.S. industry, and it's a really exciting time. And, you know, in addition to uh, lunar landings, there's development for a low Earth orbit. So we were looking at potentially for commercial space stations. We've got four contractors that NASA's working with. So I think we're going to see just a whole lot of U.S. industry um, uh, and uh, developing and and, uh, and and fielding new capabilities mm-hmm. and really seeing a growth of uh, orbital economy and then we're, we're pushing out towards developing a lunar economy as well. Yeah. So, Terry, you mentioned a couple of things that lead me to a question of, of, of what's next and, and how you design this with the uh, concept of we're going for a different purpose, right? We're not yeah. coming back. We're moving forward, right? You said space stations. Now, I understand there's like a gateway that will be there to, uh, going around the moon eventually that will kind of serve as this launching pad to the moon, but also beyond, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. So uh, the lander, you know, takes crew and equipment from lunar orbit down to the surface and back, but the crew come from Earth and travel to lunar orbit where they will um, uh, join uh, the Gateway uh, station there. Uh, the Gateway provides a great platform for um uh, doing science and, and better understanding how to live and work in space beyond our uh, uh, protected kind of radiation uh, uh, belts. So um, it's also so it's a staging point for uh, going back and forth to the lunar surface, and as you mentioned, it's also a great staging point for sending um, vehicles on to Mars. And uh, the lunar missions as a whole are a great test bed for Mars missions. So we're implementing new technologies and and, and trying new things out and learning how to live and work in a. Uh, another planetary environment, but for a Mars mission, because the distances are so long and the mission durations are so long, it would be years long missions, we really have to have high reliability systems. So giving us an opportunity to test some of our systems in some extreme environments is going to teach us how to make them more and more reliable and really get us ready for those future missions to Mars. You know, what? It, it's interesting too, and you you're talking about this lunar economy and this this space yeah. uh, economy and obviously logistics and ports and all of these things sure. feel this and you can see that infrastructure the very early nascent stage of that infrastructure being built but what commercial industry other than just getting people up into space do you think will sort of fuel that initial economy is it like asteroid mining to get materials for you know batteries and things like that or, or, or what could it be There's certainly a lot of rare materials on the moon, but uh, one of the first things I think that we'll go after maybe the easiest is uh, water. So we think there are billions of kilograms or billions of gallons of water ice on the South Pole. And water is one of those versatile resources that can be uh, broken apart to make oxygen for uh, people to breathe and then, uh, or broken apart further to make rocket fuel. So 
Uh, we certainly want to understand how extraterrestrial mining works. How do you collect these materials and process them away from Earth? Um, and then start learning how to use uh, those resources that we get and then, uh, you know, expand from there to the other maybe more challenging uh, minerals that are rare uh, here on Earth. Yeah, so it's not so much going for those to bring them back commercially, but utilizing utilizing those assets that are there in order to fuel further, not have to take the fuel off of Earth, right? Yeah, that's right. You can go, uh, again, use that uh, as a resource to go back uh, to Mars, potentially, right. or right. to fuel uh, up and down uh, transportation back and forth to the lunar surface. Wow, fantastic. Well, hey, I we got it. a question from the kids. Can we roll uh, Kids Ask NASCA clip? Sure. Guys in the back. Maybe. If you shoot a laser in space, will it go on forever until it hits something? <laughs> All right. Oh. So those two little astronauts are wanting to know. Because, you know, this came up. We were actually watching the finale of Obi-Wan. And my son, he asked me uh, He asked me the other day, was we were watching, he said, yeah. "Where like the blasters. Because in Star Wars, they shoot blasters at, at each other all the time. But they, they explode and dissipate. They don't just go off in the distance forever. That is a great question. I wish I was an optics engineer, but I'm more of a propulsion engineer. But I will tell you that, uh, you know, to get a laser, you, you have to collimate that beam and get all of those photons pointing in exactly the, the same direction. And so, um, yeah, while we, for lasers, they're very, very focused. So they're not perfectly focused. So eventually it spreads and that uh, energy dissipates over time. Uh, but they certainly... Um, uh, they certainly can go a long distance. And we are actively working on laser communications. So that is a way that, that we're talking about communicating over long distances is using lasers. And so uh, that is uh, certainly a great question and a, a field of study that's, that's very active right now as to how much power do you have to have in the laser to get it to go uh, a certain distance and, and be able to reliably use that for communication. Well, that's good. Now you can stop worrying about an alien spaceship from many light years ago shooting a laser that yeah, will eventually impact you. Yeah, hitting us, right? Yeah, like just a coming stray out of bullet. They shot a like a million bullet. years ago, they shot that thing yeah. and it finally got you. Yeah, okay, I got you. <laughs> that's the long That's the long. I, no, I, I worry about that every day. That and sinkholes. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Tara, we really appreciate your time today. This is We're really excited about this mission. We look forward to the unmanned flight in 2024 and obviously sending people back to the moon in 2025. Thank you for being so gracious and answering all our smart and stupid questions. <laughs> Thanks for having me on. It was a pleasure. Good stuff. Thanks, Tara. Yeah. It's Take awesome care. stuff. You think they have people just like thinking like uh, ridiculous stuff into the future, which isn't ridiculous when you think about really far. Like the, we, we need a juice bar on this gateway thing because astronauts are going to be coming in from Mars and other planets and be tired and going to want like a smoothie or something, right? Well, you know, How one of the things, that's, that's why I like talking to NASA because a lot of these ideas initially, they're sort of hard to conceptualize, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go, What is space logistics like? What does lunar yeah. look like? And then when you think about it and they talk about, well, you got to build ports and space ports. Sure. You just, if you think about it in terms of, they got to do RFPs, just like we got to do to get <laughs> late. got to do RFPs. If you think about it, it's the same thing. It's still humans building and running all this stuff. It is. Not just, not it, just aliens. No, yeah, absolutely. All right, before we send you home, let's go to a little good news, bad news, because it's Friday. Good news. Okay. Whoa. They're okay. All right, the first bad news, good news. They might not be. Let's see. Okay, bad news. You're at an intersection when a four-wheeler tries to muscle its way into a zipper merge. <laughs> Look at this guy right here. Getting some GTA vibes off this radio station, too. So nothing yet, right? He's just behind this other truck, truck, truck here, here leaving a little room. <laughs> They're pulling up. There's clearly cones, though, doing like... Here comes this guy out of nowhere. Oh, right. Here comes yeah, yeah, yeah. in out of nowhere, tries yeah, yeah. to muscle himself. This driver's not having it. Yeah. He wow. says, uh, you know, clearly it wasn't his wide spot, but the truck driver's like... That's not how you do it, man. That's not how you do it. Um... Yeah, that's a little that's a little tough. Yeah, I've experienced that in the bathroom once or twice. Well, here he is. He's clearing his throat as he's pulling in because I think he sees that guy turn around to follow him. He's leading him right into this little uh, this little truck stop here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on, buddy. Well, no, the person who posted that video initially on Reddit, they said that that guy followed them back and he hit the truck window with a baseball bat. And the police came and arrested him in Ontario. Oh, is that right? Yeah, it was a whole big incident. <laughs> because yeah. he, that's unbelievable, man. Hey, I've got some good news, my friend. Sure. You've parked your blue SUV in the perfect spot. Spot, nice quiet street it's sitting there nothing could go wrong bad news is this guy tries to make a left-hand turn right there check this out man he forgets that uh he's got Ooh. his uh, tandems forward Ooh, in the back that. there oh he's stuck now too yeah, yeah. he's just oh, dragging it dude oh. what are you doing <laughs> oh, oh man 
Not only is he caught on the SUV, oh, he's God. caught on the center Whoa. median. If he does. He also uh, oh, he also takes God, out a uh, a uh, irrigation pipe as well. <laughs> yeah, I think this was a PDS. That's the that's the trailer out there for GPS and GPS kick PDS. Oh. As well as that car that blue car just right. There you go. <laughs> New fountain installed in the street. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> the guy's gone. You ever so you. you ever park your car like Resident Street come out and it get trashed? I had that happen one time. I lived in. In, uh, for a brief time, right be in the transition period between me moving from California back to Boston, my parents had a place in Dana Point, so I lived with them for a yeah. little bit as I was waiting for their apartment to open, and um, parked my car on the side of the street, and uh, a lot of teenagers there and stuff, and like absentee parents. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some drunk just smashed the inst the whole side of my car, smashed the thing off. I had that happen, uh, but it was very fortuitous, because we had been four-wheel driving and ruined part of the car, and then parked it on the street, went to uh, uh, spring break, came back, and somebody hit that that exact same point and put a note on a car and we got to pay for it for insurance. So. Well, at least you got to pay it for Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Big deductible or no? Not really. Not really. Okay. Well, good news. You are headed home through the Sumner Tunnel after a hard time at work. I can tell you that boss traffic, never fun. Well, bad news. As you're headed home, you were headed home because this Swift truck got stuck Wicked big idiot, you're driving the Swift truck. He gets stuck in the Sumner Tunnel. Sumner Tunnel is only 12 foot 6 inches, right? Yeah. So what's yeah. problematic about 12 foot 6 inches, Michael Vincent? It's it's lower than that that truck. <laughs> it's not 13. It's, you, <laughs> it's like, not 13 feet. <laughs> you could ma If you got all the air out of those tires, you could, probably you could make potentially it, yeah. get there. If you yeah. drop the air ride yeah. system on there, maybe could. So a lot of people ask what happens when a truck gets stuck like that. Well, if he can't get through... They're gonna have the, the they're gonna shut down the road. They're gonna have the police come, the yeah. stadies, and the stadies are gonna back this guy out. And if they have to, they're gonna tow this guy out. They're maybe, gonna give him a big fine, and then they're gonna fine. send him on his way. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. And he's exactly. gonna have a lot of angry assholes is that, that guy got who, stuck did, in traffic. Is that guy uh, high tailing it from Arkansas by chance? Oh, he, oh, is he the one who robbed the <laughs> is bank? The <laughs> is he the one that robbed the bank? <laughs> this one's not good or bad news. This one's just pretty damn cool. A cool way to deliver some cement. Check this out. Check out this delivery uh, here where this guy is delivering his cement truck, filling up these uh, these totes. Uh, dude, last time we saw something like this, they were harvesting Christmas trees, right? Yeah, you know, th but this looks, um, those look heavy for one. Yeah. <laughs> Helicopter look free. Very I, heavy. Have you I been in a helicopter? I have been in a helicopter. Those look like 110 gallon like totes, right? I mean, that's a lot of cement. Lot of I mean, weight. heavy cement, right? Shoot so fire. what happens is something like this. The, does the truck bring this up or the truck comes to helicopter to pick it up or both? I didn't understand the question. So what's going on here? <laughs> what's going on here is this truck is delivering this and they're sliding that cement into these totes and then that helicopter is taking that cement elsewhere. Interesting. Okay, so it's a cement. Oh, actually, I think you can kind of tell, right? Is that yeah, cement truck Yeah, you're looking at the back of a from? cement truck and they're, they're pumping it into these totes and then once they're full, this helicopter's taking them out to... Uh, to a site where they obviously need some cement, a foundation or whatever it happens to be. I assume they're not pouring that on a fire. That'd be an expensive uh, way to put out a fire. Yeah. <laughs> right? How, how do you get those kind of like specialized trucking jobs? I don't, I, I don't know if you need a specialized one for this. It looks like maybe he just took his normal route to as close as he could get to to this, right? It looks like one of those pumping things, right? You ever see those where they're pumping the cement into the sides of the buildings or whatever, you know, those long pump cranes? It looks a little bit like that. Yeah, it oh, does. Very cool. It Thanks for be. the share, my friend. Uh, yeah, of course. This right here, I don't have good news. All I have is bad news. Ohio State University yeah, has successfully garnered a trademark for the three-letter word, the, <laughs> after nearly that would be, a three-year battle. That would, be, that would be the. The Ohio <laughs> State University. I'm not going to give you that. You, you the, be that. I'm the. not giving you the. I'm giving you the Ohio State University. Well, they got into a battle here. This is an interesting story. So they yeah. got locked into a uh, them and Mark Jacobs at the same time were trying to patent yeah. the word the. The reason Mark Jacobs won it the. is he patents everything and if you or trademarks everything. And if you look at this, they have the mini tote. No, patent. that's the mini tote. It's the Ohio State, and that's the mini tote. They have it's the mini grammar. tote bag. No, no, no. They it's proper grammar. If that's a, if it's a if it's a consonant, then it's the. If it's a vowel, I will not afford the. this product or the Ohio State University. That respect, <laughs> my friend. I I like what Dayton did Whoa. here. So when Dayton, when Dayton, See, when Dayton that's Dayton why beat you there guys, you go. In 2014, they had uh, they had that nice. You little, know the uh, Flyers. Uh, yeah, we beat the heck out of the Flyers in football on their uh, homecoming once when I was at. Mu or, or, 
University of Mercier, Mercier's University. So forget those guys. They don't know what the heck they're doing. They can't even play football over there in Dayton. Well, Dayton. I guess so. How this all like came about too is they have wanted to obviously because Ohio State people always feel the need to correct you when you say Ohio because it is the University. Ohio State. State. It's not the, Ohio State University. Well, whatever it is, it 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 it's it's a thing, right? It it, it is a thing. I've got something for you, my friend. No, no, I think. Did I get a message from the uh, U.S. Patent and Trademark Office? I think I did. You what? owe me some royalties, my friend, because what? Dooner has been trademarked by Michael Vincent, and uh, you can no longer go by Dooner anymore, my friend. It is, uh, you know, owe me royalties, my friend. Okay, so, but here's, okay. Couple, <laughs> that, that's, there's been a lot of confusion about this. The, the, the the only means in the context of apparel, right? Yeah. However, I they so. are the only apparel, one. right? Is that it? I don't, I know. I think that they can put out a shirt that says the on it, like just the, and they're the only ones that could do oh. it. I don't know if the condition is it also needs a... Uh, See, I read, the way I read it, it was like for sports apparel only, and they were just trying to protect people from like the University of Dayton taking it from, because it's kind of become their persona. Well, there's already an Ohio University, right? So it's, there's OSU, there's Ohio University, and then your initials, you already have Oregon State University, and you have got Oklahoma State University. Yeah, but, but why don't you go TOSU? The, Dif the difference, well, you guys yeah, are still self conscious about it. Why don't you do that? <sighs> I'm not self conscious, just proud. Well, how proud to be a buck on proud, proud to have patented. Proud <laughs> to have patented. I think it's brilliant. I think they're behind it. There, 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 there's a, a patent number, uh, registration number 49770320, serial number 8676906. You can write that down. The University of Michigan or uh, Miami, you. They yeah. patented, they trademarked you, just the letter U. So, but in what, like, just for a shirt? Or yeah, something like that? in the same vein as as uh, the for Ohio State. So, the battle over the Mark Jacobs. I guess they fought over this for three years, and yeah. they had to. The courts were telling the the trademark and patent courts were telling Ohio State that. Uh, the was only ornamental. It didn't really matter to the name. Yeah. Although it is on the sign. So to be fair, it is actually, it is literally the name of the it school. It is literally um, the name of the school, the Ohio State University. Yeah. But also Mark Jacobs, he, he as parent, he trademarks everything. Uh, he trademarked Mark. He trademarked Jacobs. He well, trademarked Mark. it literally Mark is Jason, called the mini tote bag. So Why doesn't he trademark the mini tote bag then? Why yeah, the whole the, thing. Why does it have to be? That's such the, a broad word. I don't uh, really. I don't think you should. Be maybe able to he that. felt like he could get some money out of Ohio State eventually. Well, someone did. They agree. They came to terms on yeah, it. Yeah, they, they were negotiated. Like, okay, you can share it. They negotiated with yeah. some cashola. I'm sure. They can, they're the only two who can use it now. Well, it's like. Well, I mean, it's like what's worth. What they say in this, I think in the article somewhere around twelve point some million dollars or something like that. That trademark is worth to Ohio State to have that. Yeah. Some something like that. I don't know. Wait, I gotta get out of here. I'm excited. I'm going to Old Crow Medicine Show this weekend at the grand opening at the Caverns Amphitheater down in a uh, beautiful Tennessee. I went to when I first moved out here. Uh, it's one of my wife and his favorite bands, but I had moved like three months before my wife and kids. They played at River Fest. She wasn't here in time yet. So we're right a little rough yeah, for you. We're going to bring the kids with us. Yeah, good time. Find me on Twitter awesome. at Timothy Dooner. Find him at Vincent the Dude. Don't be a stranger and tell him how to be. Hey, peace and love. Spread it everywhere. is the number one source for transportation and logistics news. FreightWaves.com provides you with in-depth news coverage, data, and insights from the leading industry journalists and market experts. On FreightWaves.com, you can also watch the only streaming TV network dedicated to freight. FreightWaves TV provides you with coverage you won't find anywhere else. However you like your news delivered, check us out online or on the FreightWaves app.
All right. Good morning. Uh, we're here at the Freightways Future Supply Chain event. My name is Dan Lewis. I'm the founder and CEO of Convoy. I'm joined by George from Shep. And today we're going to talk about innovation and freight and sustainability. Uh, George, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and Shep? Absolutely, Dan. Uh, so George Brahovsky, I've been with, uh, with Shep for a little over 15 years. Uh, variety of different roles and I lead part of the US supply chain. So I oversee uh, about 30 of our large plants um, and handle about 250,000 shipments both on the inbound and outbound. Uh, and I'm one of seven regional supply chain leaders in the US. Awesome. Um, so one question I had thinking about the industry that you're in with, you know, providing pallets and, and helping the supply chain function. You're providing a pretty traditional industrial product to a pretty industrial industry and traditional industry. How do you stay? How do you kind of maintain an innovative culture within your team and at Shep um, in that world? Yeah, great question, Dan. So, if anything, the last two years, just like for everybody else, uh, the pandemic has really expedited a lot of innovation for us. And one of the big things um, that we've been focusing on is really how do we continuously stay relevant in the market enough for our customers, for our people, and how do we build for the future? So one of the things we immediately had to work on was, quite frankly, improving our capacity, our ability to do more with less. And the way that we've been doing that is we've been heavily investing into automation in all of our sites. And really what it sort of said, how do we remain relevant to our people? Um, it's been about changing the way we work and not just for the support teams that work from home and support all of our logistics and operations functions, but also our plant-based personnel. So with automation coming in and actually exponentially growing from an investment perspective in, in our organization, we've been heavily focusing on enabling our team members at the plants to evolve with that automation. That's been a really great journey for us. Can you give an example, maybe a specific example of the type of automation you're talking about? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So in, in the pallet industry, um, there is a percentage of pallets that come back from the trade that are damaged. And there's a percentage of them that come back that are not damaged. And they all have to be brought back up to a product quality specification. And for the pallets that come back, and the same thing goes for pallets, crates, containers, any reusable secondary packaging. Uh, for the ones that do come back that are damaged, it's really a two-step process. One of them is disassembly. How do you take components off or disassemble certain parts of the asset? And then it's reassembly. So, you know, the traditional way of um, disassembling pallets was literally cutting out components using a sawzall, okay? You know, it's, it's really tough to hire for, really hard work and really tough conditions. Well, on the disassembly side, our vision is actually to move to a touchless plant. So where we've been heavily focusing on was how do we automate that? And through the use of robotics, um, vision technology, uh, we call it automat automated detection uh, inspection. We're able to actually disassemble those pallets automatically, literally a robotic arm that dips the pallet into a tank and cuts off the components. Then it's much easier to just reassemble um, the pallets together and it opens the work up to a broader range of candidates that you know we don't have to depend just on industrial athletes to do that type of work. That's really interesting. We're going to talk about sustainability a little bit today. And you know what you just described to me suggests you can more quickly process more pallets through a facility, which means that you need to have fewer total pallets to meet demand, which is more efficient and reduces waste. You're able to probably more accurately identify what needs to be fixed in a, in a pallet and fix it more precisely, which again, lets pallets have a longer life which is really interesting. I've never done the thought about like all these sustainability angles of how you guys can improve and how that actually impacts waste and kind of total product need. Um, on that lens and kind of going down that path, can you maybe just share what sustainability means to you and to Shep? 
Yeah, absolutely. So we've been um, we've been really on a journey um, as far as sustainability is is, is concerned at in our organization. And and Dan, it's the business model is 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 what has driven a lot of that. So we are in the share and reuse space. So instead of having a make, use, destroy linear model, we're really you know we have a tagline which is the pioneers of the circular economy. Well, our assets are continuously reused. We have over 330 million assets in 60 countries that support 46 out of the top 50 consumer packaged goods companies and you know on most retailers that you could think of in almost every channel so right from the start it, it started off with the business model now where we've been really focusing on is instead of just saying how do we as an as a company um strive towards being less bad so you you know you you, you see a lot of objectives around being uh, zero carbon emissions or net zero emissions from, from a lot of organizations, um, we've really challenged that because again, our business model is sustainable to begin with. Um, we're, we're pushing to be better. Being less bad is not good enough. We need to be better than that. So for our organization, and this, this is true for every employee um, that works for our, for, for, for our company, uh, it's really about being positive. So we're focusing on um, building regenerative supply chains. So an example of that is um, instead of replacing the tree that we use for our raw materials, well, we're actually replacing two trees. Um, so it, it really is about being more. So being more. better is, is not just kind of coming back to that net neutral position. Mm -hmm. You're saying, how do we actually give more than we're taking from the system? Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Can you, just a fun fact, what are the longest, you know, tenured pallets? Like, how long does can a pallet last in your network? And you talk about its sustainability at its core. I'm imagining you guys are fixing a pallet for a long time. Do you track the individual pallets and how long they've survived in the system? Yeah. So there's different there's different ways that we do that. Uh, the best way to answer that, Dan, is we um, we we see pallets that will last over 10 years in the supply chain because we have the ability to replace individual components, going back to that disassembly to, to, to reassembly part. Um, now, with the use of technology, we do have certain pallets out there that, that we do track continuously and are serialized that give us better insights into not just um, where they are, but how they're used as well. So that is a capability that we've been uh, extensively working on now. That's cool. Yeah, I was just curious if you have like the old Oldest pallet in your network, <laughs> and it's got a name. Yeah, no, that, <laughs> that's a good job. idea. I'll take that one back. Um, all right, so I th the regenerative idea is really interesting. What are some of the other things you know that you guys can do? Um, and I think your business is so fascinating because you know it is at the core of everyone else's supply chain and everyone else's logistics. So it feels like a force multiplier when it comes to to improving the supply chain. Because if you guys make improvements to the pallets, whether it's you know durability, weight, can handle, you know, they don't break as easily, whatever it is, it kind of helps everybody else's supply chain. Um, and I think that, you, are there things you guys can do from a sustainability perspective with your work that you think can help other people be more successful with their sustainability initiatives. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so part of that, we do have a customer collaboration program uh, called the Zero Waste World, where we do actually partner with our customers and the industry to help solve for common challenges. And we, we, we break that down into three main parts. Um, one of them is how do we reduce inefficiencies in the supply chain? An example of that is we have a ton of data. We have the origin and shipment of, sorry, origin and destination of every pallet that moves out there, which is core to our program. We need to make sure we can recover them. Um, so by using that data, we're able to unlock um, a lot of network visibility out there that as an industry connector helps us identify opportunities for customers to, whether it's benchmarking their inventory churns, whether it's connecting transport, which is the second part of the program, um, which allows them to help eradicate empty miles. So we have a customer transport collaboration program where we're able to match, whether it's a shipper with a shipper, um, to, to share common capacity on certain lanes, improve truckload fill rates, um, 
those are some of the examples. And then uh, on the product waste, it's it's really interesting. Um, I thought we had a chat, a chat about that yesterday. It's how do we repurpose not just our waste, but potentially our customers' waste to put that back into things like um, composite materials in that could further help reduce weight of pallets. So taking for your customers' waste and making pallets with that in, in some ways. Or That's an example of areas yeah, that well. we've been exploring. Absolutely. That's really cool. Um, how do you, yeah, I, I think we think about it. You mentioned empty miles. That's something that Convoy is very focused on. And when we think about sustainability, we tend to think about it from that perspective, reducing empty miles and, and kind of, you know, unnecessary time sitting and idling is on the one hand, and then making the profession of being a truck driver more sustainable. And so we have the ability to think impact both of those. On the empty miles side, we look a lot at, you know, we have a bunch of trailers, so how do we build systems that are innovative and that allow, whether it's, you know, making the trailer available to the, the driver that does the convoy job for the next job they want to do that might be outside the convoy network, combining drop and hook with live, just combining different types of jobs and giving the, the driver flexibility to reuse that trailer uh, as a way to efficiently reposition it without having to do an empty run. So how do, what are all the things we can do to get that trailer where it needs to be? whether it's our job or somebody else's job, without having to you know, run empty back? Um, or you know, how do we collaborate with, with you or others to figure out how we can combine multiple loads together and reduce empty miles? So just have fewer deadheads, fewer empty legs. And it's something we're actually, you know, I know we talked to you guys about it. How do we think about this across you and then also the customers that you support? And how do we think about the freight network that way? And I get really, I think a huge part of the potential to reduce empty miles is on being more open with our networks and sharing. And I guess, what are the areas where you guys are comfortable um, partnering with other people on freight planning? And, and where are areas where that might be um, harder for you to do or it's just you, you've run into issues in that in the past? Yeah, gr great question again, Dan. Um, if, if anything, again, going back to my original statement of the pandemic um, expediting a lot of innovation, I, um, I feel that our organization has been innovative to begin with. We've been always willing to try new things. And if I recall, we actually were one of the first people to partner with Convoy originally. Yeah. And um, I, I feel that it starts with, with having the right open-minded culture to, to really challenge the norms. And um, I'm seeing more and more of that with our, with our teams. Just because we have a defined you know, RFP process when we go to RFP or just because we have certain agreements structured in traditional ways, um, Dan, we're, we're as an organization always pushing the boundaries to challenge ourselves to think differently and really try to look at the larger picture. It may not just be about hitting one, two, three main metrics from a traditional service level agreement. Once we add in the wider ripple effect of what that would mean as far as helping to reduce miles in a broader network, uh, not just from a, not just from, um, from, from a business standpoint, just, just from a, the right thing to do. Um, you know, I, I think those are all the key elements and as being one of the leaders in our organization and, you know, working with the teams that go through those cycles, um, this is where I see a big part of my job being is, is making sure that people can see a bigger picture and helping them make those decisions to drive more collaboration. That makes a lot of sense. I, so, you know, we were thinking, we, we talked about it yesterday, and one of the things that I thought about during and after that is we get asked a lot as a tech company, um, how do you, you know, obviously relationships really matter in the industry. Are you guys just tech? And one of the things that I've, I've kind of realized is there is no innovation without relationships. There is no tech innovation without relationships. And I'll explain what that means. So, and also really sustainability because sustainability tends to be, if you do it the way you've always done it, then it won't become more sustainable because it's the same thing you've always done. So it requires a change in process or a change in approach or technology. So that generally relates to innovation. Every time you're trying to build an innovative new thing and launch it to the market, you have to test it with somebody. You have to try it first. You have to A-B test it, figure out if it's gonna work, what's the best approach. And if you don't have trust and relationships with customers, nobody's gonna let you try it. And you can't do it in a vacuum in, in, in the freight industry. 
And so I've, I've kind of come to the realization there is, you can't actually be a tech innovator without having incredibly strong relationships. And frankly, you have to have better relationships to be a tech innovator than to be a traditional, more traditional player because you're asking people to take risks. And so when I think about, you know, sustainability, I think, you know, with what you're saying of, of like that partnership mindset, being one of the first to try something, we need people like that as partners. And for us, it's impossible to innovate and to do new things that drive sustainability without those kinds of partners and without trust. And so I think, you know, the, that's something that I just think matters a lot. It's, you know, I appreciate the, the ability to work with you guys over time. And I think that's a good message for a lot of folks, which is it's not either or. You actually can't innovate without relationships. So work on relationships, and then the people will trust you to do cool things later and try things. Absolutely. And, and you know, from the shipper's perspective, um, like I mentioned, Dan, for, for, for a leader like myself in the business, it's to enable that, right? It's getting away from the fear of failing. It's promoting learning, right? We have the saying, it's like, hey, we're either going to succeed or we're going to learn. So That's a good way to think about it. All right. Thank you, George, for joining, joining me today. It's been fun at this conference. Um, and we'll, uh, we're going to go hang out and check out the booths now. Sounds Thanks, good. Everybody. Thanks, Sam. FreightWaves is the number one source for transportation and logistics news. FreightWaves.com provides you with in-depth news coverage, daily